Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, thank you so much for that really nice introduction. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah? 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 Okay. <laughs> and um, I really want to thank Alternatives for inviting me, and um, I want to thank the translators for helping with access. And I, again, especially thanks to Peerlink, to um, Amy Zulik, Dee Hayes, Danita Demata, and Nicole Courier. Again, another round of applause for all their great work in putting this together. <clears throat> and and I, was, I was just reading on the Peerlink website that um, Nicole is a pit bull advocate. And I don't know, quite know what that is, but we definitely need more of those in the movement, for sure. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. People may remember that um, a couple of years ago, Robert Whitaker and I were almost disinvited from Alternatives. Do you remember that? And then Alternatives made the right decision, and we were both able to speak. And uh, exactly, exactly. And that, that's the power of our movement, the power of diversity, and the power of getting our voices heard. And um, Bob was talking about medications and a more honest approach about how they're helpful sometimes, but also have a lot of harm that they cause. And I was doing a workshop um, on coming off medications, and I'll be doing that workshop again uh, next year, uh, this year, and hopefully next year I'll be doing it as well. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to do it every year <laughs> if, I, if I can. Yeah. So. Um, and there was a lot of fear about inviting Bob, um, but he was finally given a chance to speak. It was fine. Nothing happened. It wasn't like that the sky grew dark and it started to thunder and their power went off in the building or something. But Oh, wait. Actually, all that did happen, right? Do you remember that? Just a coincidence. Um, so... Um, I'm not having a relapse of schizophrenia, and my delusional beliefs are not coming back with uh, ideas of reference because that was just a coincidence, right, people? Okay, so a lot, uh, the reason I, I like to mention that, because that is significant to me, and a lot of my work is about talking about my own altered states and the fact that I live with a lot of experiences that would be called symptoms. You don't have to get rid of all your symptoms to live a fully recovered, happy, healthy life. <clears throat> And part of my um, view is that the universe is talking to me all the time. This is part of my spiritual belief, and I want that to be respected by the medical profession and respected by the culture that I live in. Um, it's not a sign of schizophrenia or, or relapse. In fact, a lot of the things that we're taught are signs of disease, um, can be looked at very differently, and maybe we need to change our relationship with them rather than just simply thinking that as soon as it's there, we have to just get rid of it and be afraid of it. Um, I can continue to live sometimes with, with suicidal feelings. I'm committed to being here. I'm not going to take my life. But sometimes, yes, I do have feelings that life is not worth living and, and, and feelings that I want to die. Um, I continue to hear voices. I feel presences. Um, I'm, I hear noises. I hear um, machine noises. And sometimes I, f I go into very withdrawn and fearful states where I can't communicate. And this is still happening to me, even though I'm, I'm recovered and I'm working and I'm part of society. And sometimes I, um, I get overwhelmed. And when I was recently, I was in New York City. And I don't know if anybody is here from New York, but there are these, yeah. Do you see that, you know those taxi cabs that say never hide everywhere? Wow, that was because I, I, those are, I, those are, yeah, that's me. That's, I, those are my taxi, taxi cabs. Those taxi cabs are me. I'm there. That's me. So I have these really strong connections with mystical messages and, and what psychiatry would call uh, symptoms of schizophrenia. I just call the way I live in the world. And I've changed my relationship to it. And um, just to give you an example of this, um, just recently, remember, people remember when the, the movie The Bat, Batman, The Dark Knight came out and there was that terrible, terrible, um, tragedy. And it really affected me because the last time I was in a mental health residence was in 1999. And people remember that was when the, the Columbine um, tragedy happened, in, also in, in Colorado. And 1999 was also um, the year that the movie The Matrix came out. And I, if you have any kind of tendency towards going into extreme states, I don't recommend that you watch The Matrix over and over and over <laughs> and over again, because that's, that's what I did in 1999. And, and you know, I, I went into a really deep, deep extreme state. And I, when the Columbine um, tragedy happened, I believed that I was very connected to it, and I was getting all these messages. And I was terrified. 
And um, I ended up going, having a big crisis and going back into a mental health residence. Um, that was in 99. And now, when um, the Dark Knight Rises film came out um, and the tragedy happened, also in Colorado, I started to make those connections again. And I got really scared and I was feeling that the whole universe is this diabolical thing that's trying to hurt me. And I, I called a friend and I was trying to get some support. And then this bus went by with this giant image of the ocean and I was remembered about one of my biggest fears it has to do with the ocean and swimming out in the ocean and sharks and so I was really really getting into a really deep state but I have to work right and so I, I'm going on a plane and I'm going to a training and when I get into the plane I, I almost missed the plane I was so panicky and I was upset and I was really really um, having a really hard time I get onto the plane I sit down the guy next to me is wearing a Batman t-shirt okay <laughs> Okay, so now it's getting really, 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 it's, it's getting really something, okay? So I, I, finally I get to change planes and get away from this guy, and I sit down next to somebody, and I notice that she's reading a book in Spanish, and I kind of look at the title of the book, and it's Don Miguel Ruiz's The Four Agreements, which people, I don't know if people know that, but that's a spiritual book. It's a very powerful book that... Um, is uh, from the Huichol tradition in, in, in Mexico, and it teaches about signs and seeing messages from the universe and how, how things are connected. So now I'm getting really, really freaked out. Like the whole universe is starting to really do something here. And then when I get off the plane, I arrive and I was, I was going to South Dakota. I get off the plane and it's dusk, and I walk out to get a cab, and I'm sort of hearing stuff kind of flying over my head or something, and it's like, what are those birds? And there were bats. There were bats flying. So, okay, so, <laughs> so the moral of the story is I, did, I didn't panic. I didn't, I didn't get overwhelmed like I would have more than 10 years ago. I've changed my relationship to my extreme states, and I'm not feeling disempowered. I'm not feeling isolated. I've normalized it for myself within my own worldview. And that's a really, really important um, thing that I've learned in my own recovery, is to think about my experiences that used to get called symptoms or being seen as signs of my illness or signs of relapse, to think of them differently and to have the power, because I'm thinking of them differently, to be able to work with them differently and to engage with them. And I, I think this is really, really important, that the, the issue really is not seeing things differently or feeling things differently or having a different view and experience of the world. The issue really is fear. The issue really is shame. The issue really is isolation. That's what we need to be working on, not overcoming these so-called diseases and disorders. <laughs> and this, the title of this talk is Remembering Our History. And one of the most important things that I think is instructive from the history of our movement and from the history of psychiatry and mental health is that it used to be that being homosexual was in the DSM as a mental disorder. People know this. Being gay was considered being sick and a disease and a mental disorder. And it wasn't until 1986 that it was taken out that people, you often hear that, oh, it was taken out in 1973. No, actually, it wasn't until 1986 because they still had something called ego, ego dystonic homosexuality, that if you were gay and it was a problem for you, then that was a mental disorder. Well, actually, I thought that, the, that being gay was okay. The problem is homophobia. That's the problem. So, so, so we're in a different place with, with being gay and homosexuality and was taken out of, of the DSM, DSM completely, and we accept diversity and we speak openly about this. And that, this is slowly starting to happen with coming off medications. People are less afraid of it. They're more willing to, op to be open to it. It's not seen as just a symptom of your illness that you don't like your medications. Yes, medications work for many people, but also some of us, they don't work for us. And we need help and support when we want to discuss coming off medications. And it's no longer as much of a taboo as it was. I, I'm going to keep working on that <laughs> to make it less of a taboo. And more and more people are joining in on this. And I'm doing a workshop on coming off medications here at... Um, at Alternative. And the same issue is also happening with hearing voices. That it actually it turns out that hearing voices is a much more common human experience. There are many, many people who hear voices who don't have a problem with it. In fact, the, if you look, the entire Old Testament was written by people who hear voices, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, so, 
Sigmund Freud, the, the founder of modern psychology, talked about how he heard voices, right? So clearly hearing voices is something that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a psych psychiatric patient or that you're sick, but it's the relationship that we have to it, the fear around, the isolation, the shame, the not talking about, the seeing it as a symptom, as a sign of a disease. And there's been a lot of work and a lot of advocacy around this issue of hearing voices that it actually shouldn't be seen as a disorder and a disease. And the word is what, I, what I'm hearing from the people who are developing the new DSM, the new list of all the mental disorders, that in the DSM-5, hearing voices is going to be taken out as a sole uh, characteristic of schizophrenia and psychosis, that it will be taken out. So, so this is something that's very instructive, and let's cross our fingers around that. And the Hearing Voices movement did this really through the power of peer support. Um, the movement started in uh, the Netherlands. It gave places, people a place to talk about their experiences, to explore their experiences without judgment, to talk about voices without necessarily needing to get rid of them, but to talk about the fear and the isolation and the disempowerment so that we could change our relationship to that experience. And that was very instructive to me that that movement has been so successful and it's given a lot of us a real impetus to, um, to working on spreading these hearing voices groups. And it's not just for voices, it's all for all kinds of extreme states. It's a place that I can go and talk about my experiences with the Matrix and Columbine and the Dark Knight Rises and all the different things that I went through without being judged. And it helps to bring the fear down around that and, and to overcome the taboo. So. This is really exciting to me because do people know that, that I think for everything that gets considered psychosis, that everything that gets considered a sign of a mental illness, there are people who are living with it somewhere in the world who don't have a problem with it at all. So, and, um, and it's not to romanticize these experiences because they are terrifying. I mean, absolutely. I've been through so much suffering about these extreme states, but also the possibility that I could live with them and not be scared and, and not be um, held back and not be oppressed by them has been really, really important for my own recovery. And there's actually some research, if you start to look at the research. Um, in 1998, there was a study in uh, psychological medicine, and they look at 1,000 individuals who were patients of primary care um, physicians, and they surveyed them, interviewed them, and they found that between 5 and 70% of these 1,000 people had some kind of psychotic experience. And none of them were psychiatric patients. None of them were having a problem with their experience, between 5 and 70% of them. So there's a lot of research supporting the idea that we don't necessarily have to see ourselves as diseased or sick or having a disorder just because we think differently and have unusual extreme experiences. So my goal would be to have all these things taken out of the DSM so that there's nothing in the DSM at all. And, 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 that, and that people would be able to qualify for services without having to get a label or be told that they're sick. I mean, if someone is experiencing domestic violence, we say, wow, we need to help you. Society needs to support you without saying that this is a medical issue. It's a social problem that needs to be met with help and support without taking it into a whole medical framework. So this is really important for my own recovery and I think for a lot of people's recovery to not necessarily see everything that we go through as symptoms, to use a different kind of language and to be open to the experiences and to get help around the fear, the shame, and the isolation. And one of the things, of course, that we need to be open to is the way in which so many of these experiences are related to trauma. Because when I go into those states that everything is connected and I'm looking for little signs and I'm, I'm totally on edge, in a lot of ways I'm, I'm remembering what it was like to grow up in my family with my father. I never knew what was coming next. Um, I had to look for little signs and signals. It was a very paranoia inducing um, environment to live in my family because my father was so unpredictable because of the trauma that he survived. So now I have a different framework that I had a normal response to an extreme situation. And that normal response as a traumatized person has given me a great suffering, but it's also given me incredible gifts that in many ways trauma can be an initiation for a lot of us. And so um, the, um, this view of, of trauma being um, important and um, one of the factors that's involved with psychotic experiences, this was not looked at for many years, but it's starting to make a comeback in some of the research. Um, there was just a, recently a study in the British Journal of Psychiatry um, April 20th, um, 2011, that looked at more than 7,000 people in England, and that they concluded that the association 
between childhood sexual abuse and psychosis is large and may be causal. The result, these results have important impl implications for the nature and etiology of psychosis and for its treatment and for prevention. So that's the, um, the British Journal of Psychiatry is, is, is saying that, that child abuse may be causal for psychosis. And I'm quoting a lot of research studies these days because I was at the American Psychiatric Association. That's kind of the language that they speak. But it's also a good, it's a good sign that things are changing. And one of the things I think we need to really recognize is um, that one of the experiences that people can live with and it's a very difficult experience, but it's something that I live with, and I think that we overreact with fear and with shame and with, um, with stigmatization, is this experience of, um, of suicidal feelings. And um, one, of the things that, one of the things that happens with people when you have uh, suicidal feelings and you talk about it is you receive forced treatment. And we all know that, that some people you know, do appreciate that they were put into the hospital, they do find that that was helpful, um, for a lot of people, it's very traumatizing, and our movement is really about rethinking forced treatment. If we want to think about forced treatment in new ways, we need to start thinking about suicidal feelings in new ways. It's much more common than we realize to sometimes feel like you want to end your own life. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do it. I mean, I'm committed to being here, but sometimes I do have those feelings. And we create a situation where people aren't free to talk about it. That's terrible, that's backwards. People need to be free to talk about their suicidal feelings. And again, looking at the research, one of the, one of the groups that's doing some of the most interesting and honest research about suicide and suicidal feelings is the US Army, because they're so interested. There's so many um, people who are ending up taking their own lives that the Army is really looking at this question of, well, how can we predict suicidal behavior? How can we predict who's gonna attempt suicide and who's not gonna attempt suicide? And there was a study um, uh, by Gam and Rieger called, by the Army called Army Suicide a Prerequisite to Suicide Prevention. And it states clearly that they cannot predict. They can't predict. They looked at lots of different studies, and uh, they can't predict who will um, attempt and who will not attempt, even with all the risk factors. And they said that because of this, what happens is that they're assuming that people are going to attempt suicide, and therefore they're using very heavy interventions. And, and in the study it says, well-intentioned interventions are surely targeting many for whom the intervention is not needed. Clinicians are committing numerous fal false positive errors. Many individuals who are not truly su suicidal may be targeted with intrusive interventions and suffer adverse effects because of the inability to predict suicide. Specific interventions to prevent suicide in a high-risk individual may, be, may violate confidentiality, harm the therapeutic relationship, increase stigma, decrease the probability of conversations about suicidal ideation in the future, and increase the probability of treatment dropout. That's the US Army is basically supporting the perspective that we need to talk about these experiences and not react with fear and locking people up. So the effect is that... <clears throat> So, so the real effect of risk assessment and um, uh, intervening with people with forced treatment is to deal with the fear that the providers have, to deal with the professionals being afraid of being responsible and being blamed. And we need to take that on um, head on because that's a, a really big issue that's not serving people. And it's about cultures of fear in agencies and hospitals. And um, even if you have all the risk factors you can't predict, doesn't mean we, we can't try and help people and support people much, but one of the biggest ways to help people and support people as much as we can is by giving them a space to talk and peer support, and that's what we're all doing here, and that's what we're all about. And um, there's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And um, I'm glad to hear there's so much support for this experience, because we, for this, this perspective, because we all know that it's true, and there's a lot of really great work going on f around the country now. One example is in Western Massachusetts, where they have a, a suicidal feelings, alternatives to suicide support group. And it's really beneficial for people because if you give people forced treatment, if you lock them up, them up, what do they learn? They learn to not talk about feelings of being suicidal, right? And that's, that's totally backwards. People need to be free to talk about these experiences. So I choose to live with my suicidal feelings. Sometimes I'm working on them, I have less of them. And I'm, I see them not as a sign of disease or relapse, but as a message. I'm, I have a deep commitment, a spiritual commitment to not take my own life. But I see suicidal feelings not as a sign that someone is giving up on life. 
When someone gives up on life, they go to work in the morning, they come home, they sit in front of television, you know, they stay up late watching David Letterman, they wake up, they go to work in the morning. That's what giving up on life looks like. No. <laughs> right, right, right? That's giving up on life. We, uh, we, we just don't have a label for that. That's called being normal, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Suicidal feelings are a desperate need for change. Desperate need for change. You've got to make a change in your life, and you need it so desperately, you're not willing to continue your life unless that change happens. And you have that desperate need for change, and you feel totally powerless to get that change met in your life. And so when I have these feelings, that's how I encounter them. I encounter them as a message. What is it that needs to change? How can I get some power to change? And we should remember that many cultures see sadness and melancholia and suicidal feelings from a very different perspectives. We've just, we've just started to pathologize them and turn them in to a signs of a disease rather than seeing them as part of the human experience that needs to be met with compassion, understanding, curiosity, and above all, deep, deep connection and listening. So, thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, I, you know, I didn't want to just focus on my own personal experience. One of the things that I did um, as part of preparation for, uh, for this talk is um, everybody knows what evidence-based um, practices, evidence-based research, you, you've all heard of this, right? Evidence-based, right? evidence-based medicine. Yeah, I, I think we've heard a little too much about it. Um, but um, you know, I, I realized how important this is, so I decided to develop a survey to develop my um, my talk today. And so I did a survey online. I had a lot of people um, answer questions about what they wanted me to say, what they wanted me to focus on. I thought it was really, really important to do this survey so that my talk today would be an EBK. Do you know what an EBK is? It's an evidence-based keynote. That's, that's what I. So, so this is this is an evidence-based keynote, and you can, you can, uh, you can it's a scientific instrument called Survey Monkey, and um, you can, you can go to my website willhall.net/alternatives2012, and you can you can read the the um, the responses. A lot of them were really interesting and um, and thought-provoking. Um, one person, very creative. One person, I asked, "What should I say?" at alternatives, and one person just wrote, give him hell, Will. <laughs> so, so I thought that was cool. Um, somebody, else, somebody else said that I should discuss the power of psychiatry and what we can do to take it away. <laughs> I thought that was great. And I asked people, um, you know, what, what should we do, what should people in different agencies, what should different mental health agencies um, do to truly serve people's recovery? And one response that I had was that all mental health offices should have 24-hour streaming of Madness Radio. I thought that was that's pretty cool. Um, uh, and uh, one person just wrote one word, skateboarding. <laughs> um, and I was thinking, wow, finally, somebody who understands the deeper meaning of my message. And, and uh, it's, does anybody know, is, 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 does skateboarding actually have a Medicare billing code? Yeah, can we, can we work on that? That's really important. Get that on the agenda. Um, so, and then someone else said, um, dear Will, I'm sure you'll cover all the bases without needing more input. So I thought that was, that was really nice. So thank you, a lot of confidence in me. And there were a lot of themes, of course, were, were the themes that you're hearing at the conference and the workshops and the other um, keynotes. There was a lot of interest in, in open dialogue. Um, Dan and Karen are doing a workshop on open, open dialogue. I'll give you a, a really quick little elevator speech on what open dialogue is. Um, we're really interested in recovery, right? For psychosis, for schizophrenia, for experiences that get labeled things like schizophrenia, bipolar, psychosis. You gotta look around the world to where they're having the best results for recovery, right? It's common sense. Let's look around the world to see where the best recovery rates are for schizophrenia. In a five-year study in the open dialogue program in Western Finland, 82% of people recovered. 82% of the reco people recovered didn't have so-called psychotic experience. 86% returned to their studies or a full-time job. 14, only 14% were on disability. Um, and uh, only 17% had relapsed during the first two years. These are incredible recovery outcomes, incredible. It's all very well documented. It's all evidence-based. They've done lots and lots of research on it. They've been doing this program for 20 years. You know what one of the keys 
to um, the success of open dialogue is lower use of medications. Lower use of medications. And they're not anti-medications. Many people do use medications in the open dialogue program, but they use it very carefully and they use much, much lower use of medications. So um, this has, has been a very, very innovative approach. One of the other very interesting principles of open dialogue is they don't believe that the problems that get called psychosis are inside of individuals. They don't believe that the problems are inside of individuals. I mean, we have, we have something like this in the social model of disability. People know about the social model of disability, that the problem is in society, not accommodating people, not with the person who has the disability because it's really a form of difference. Well, in open dialogue, they believe that the problem isn't inside of an individual. The problem is with the relationships between individual, and it's the relationships that need help. And so they bring in families, they bring in neighbors, they bring in uh, coworkers, and they talk in a social way as a group, and they talk openly. The doctors don't sit there with a clipboard and then go into another room and then talk um, privately and in secret about you and then create their, their notes, which to me is like a completely a setup for creating paranoia, right? They're, they are studying you. They are, they are watching your every move. They are talking about you behind your back. In the open dialogue approach, they discuss everything openly with the person who needs support there, with the family, with everyone there. So, and, and I wanna say that this is one of the things that I, I feel very strongly about, is that whatever kind of cold war has developed between survivors and family members, we need to build bridges and end that cold war. We need to start communicating with our families and connecting with families and bringing the families in. It doesn't mean we need to stop talking about child abuse or trauma that people have experienced in families, but families are suffering too, and we really need to bring them into the dialogue because they're key to helping people recover, and this has been a key part of the approach in open dialogue. And um, so I'm very excited that, that there's a workshop here happening about open dialogue. I'm very inspired to be learning more and studying it. And um, that was one of the many things that people talked about in the survey that I did. And another thing is that, that people mentioned, someone wrote, um, for heaven's sake, Will, please keep hammering at the importance of safe, slow tapering off of psychiatric medications. And this is something that I'm doing a lot with my coming off medications work. It's not about saying people should come off. It's about educating people so that they have options. One of the big messages is, well, when people go too fast and they end up having big problems, what they're experiencing often is the fact that they went too fast. They're having withdrawal symptoms based on the fact that they went too fast. The doctor, what does the doctor say? That's a sign your illness has come back and you need medications. You can't you try it again. Don't try and go back off of medications. Instead, or they need more medications, exactly. Instead of helping the person saying, okay, let's do it smarter the next time. Let's slow down. Let's stop and think. Let's get some supports in place. Let's discuss this. Let's figure out alternative ways that you can support yourself and alternative wellness approaches. So that's a big, big message of the harm reduction to coming off psychiatric um, drugs. It's now in its second edition. You are, this is Creative Commons copyright. You have advanced permission to download this and print it as many times as you want. It's being used in many, many countries. It's being used in lots of different agencies, peer support. It's being used by nurses. It's being even used by some psychiatrists in some clinical settings. It's been translated into five languages. I, it just recently was translated into Bosnian, uh, which is very exciting. And um, so that was a big interest in the survey. A lot of the other things that were talked about in the survey, and you can, again, you can, you can read it on my website, willhall.net slash altern um, alternatives2012. Um, people were really interested in self-directed care and self-directed spending, uh, peer-run respites, um, a very inspiring alternative that people need to have in every community needs a peer-run respite. Uh, peer-run warm lines, in, in Oregon we have the David Rompuy warm line, which is a model for other communities around the, around the country. Um, certified peer specialists, we need to really support this. So you certified peer specialists, you need to get paid more. You need to get paid more. Do, do you have a union? Do you have a union? That's how you get paid more in this society. You form a union. So this is really important. I want to see the I want to see certified peer specialists as a, as a pathway in a ladder of career advancement. I want people to get their bachelor's degree, to get to their GEDs, get their high school diplomas. Go on and get your master's. It's not that hard. It's a psychological obstacle. You can do it. Some of you should even become nurses. Oh my God, some of you should even become psychiatrists. <laughs> I mean, 
why should they go to the top of the ladder? Everyone should do it. Don't just be stuck in, in a low pay certified peer specialist. The peer, certified peer specialist movement is the beginning of a bigger movement of people coming out about their experiences and using them to support people. Um, so, and I don't know if you've, have you heard this joke, um, how many peer specialists does it take to change a light bulb? Have you, have you heard that? Um, none. The light bulb needs to learn how to change itself. <laughs> I, think we came up the, I think we came up with that in South Dakota. So something about the bats and Batman and just, so um, a lot of the survey was also there were people talking about nutrition, food allergies. How many people here realize, I mean this is not, for, not everyone is the same obviously around allergies, but a lot of us, how many people here know that they can't eat gluten because it contributes to their mental problems. Thank you so much for raising your hand and if, it's, if you're too shy that's fine too. I want all of us to speak up more because this is a big issue. Food allergies is a big issue. The food is getting better and better at alternatives, yay. Um, so let's make it even better next time and let's, uh, let's keep bringing awareness of nutrition and diet. The food that I ate in, in the hospital was horrible and made me feel worse. Um, exercise is really important. Um, and the other thing that I think is, is really important, I'm going to be talking about this a little bit in a moment too, is that we need to really recognize that we are a culturally and ethnically and racially diverse society. We need to overcome legacies of oppression, racism, sexism, and really recognize that people need to be welcomed who are, who are part of that diversity. African Americans, Native Americans, Asians, Latinos. We need to have bilingual services. We need to be welcoming people from different perspectives and make sure that we have a multicultural, inclusive, and culturally responsive movement. This is very, very important. And we, we, don't, we don't live in a post-racial society, folks. Racism is, is alive and well, and it continues in new forms. It's very important that we be, we be aware of this. And one of the things that people talked about in the, um, in the survey as well was uh, the, 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 the issue of shame. And I said this is really shame, fear, isolation, disempowerment. This is really what these issues are about. And the problems that people have going into mixed gender hospital wards, this can be very traumatizing if you're a sexual abuse survivor. For, for women, especially if you've, you've, you're in a ward that there, there are men, that can be very, very problematic. It can be very tra problematizing and, and humiliating and just add to shame. And um, this issue of, of I mean, I don't, I don't smoke cigarettes. I have problems with cigarette smoke. But believe me, if I smoked cigarettes and I was in an extreme state and I go into the hospital, I don't want a cold turkey off my cigarettes. That's, that's, that's crazy. Come on. I mean, people need to be able to have their cigarettes in the hospital. Don't add another level of stress. I mean, in, in the name of their health? I mean, come on. I mean, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And another thing that's, that's humiliating and, 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 and contributes to shame is that people go into hospitals and the first thing that happens is their cell phones get taken away from them. I mean, come on. It, it, let's ask some of the nurses and psychiatrists and, and people who work on the staff. If someone took your cell phone away from you, how would you feel? I mean, you're going to be distressed without your cell phone. It's very common for people to be distressed without their cell phone. Let people have their cell phones in the hospital. I mean, how, how hard is that? And they, exactly, and they say that it's, they say that it's, it's um, about privacy and, and cameras, and I have a solution for that. It's called tape. You tape up the lens of the camera, and then that's not a problem. Actually, one of the, um, I'm on the board with the Mental Health Association. One of our board members, Jenny Westberg, did some research, and it turns out there's actually a kind of tape that you can put on a cell phone that um, will show you if the person has taken it off and put it back on because it changes color. Because in a lot of corporate environments, they have the same issue with cell phone camera privacy. So this is, this, that's an excuse. We can find a way to have people have access to their cell phones. And of course, there's many, many ways in which the humiliations and shame in the hospital si situation um, continue. And, and, and many of those, there are some really powerful stories um, on the survey, so I encourage people to read that if you get if you get a chance. And one of the other things that um, uh, you know, Dan, Dan mentioned, I must I must not sleep. Well, I tell you, sleep is it's on the top of my agenda for my wellness. Actually, sleep is really really important for me. And um, and and sometimes I go without sleep. I you know I, I go without sleep, and I know that I'm going to go into a little bit of an altered state. But that's my choice, and I, I sometimes I like those states a little bit, not too much. 10% mania works really well for me. More than 10%, I, you know, I need, to, I need to get to sleep. But um, 
one of the things that we can do, and this is, this is simple, folks, we can dramatically improve the recovery rates for bipolar disorder, for mania that gets diagnosed as bipolar disorder by seeing it as a sleep issue. It's very simple. When someone goes into a so-called manic state, they go into the hospital, what do they do? The hospital gets them to sleep. They clobber them over the head with meds to get them to sleep, but it works. The person comes out, and then the problem is then they say, oh, you know, you have an underlying disease called bipolar disorder, now you need to take meds for the rest of your life. No, that's gonna risk major problems with those medications. It also doesn't understand what really happened to the person. Educate the person, get them, get them to sleep, and then get them off the medications that help them sleep gradually. Educate them, educate the people around them, their friends and their family. Teach them that for whatever reason, it's a mystery. You're someone who goes into altered states, and if you don't want to go into those altered states, maybe you do sometimes, but if you don't want to go into those altered states, then you really need to take a look at your sleep because sleep is a trigger. And I think this is a huge, huge awareness issue around mental health issues. And I, I personally would like to see us start um, a new national holiday um, in the United States called National Sleep Deprivation Day. <laughs> and um, we can all celebrate National Sleep Deprivation Day by not sleeping for 24 hours and then talking in our communities about what it's like to not sleep for 24 hours and realize that it's not just the people who have the bipolar disorder diagnosis who are vulnerable to getting crazy if they don't sleep. So, so that's really important. And there's a lot of really um, uh, practical innovations that we can implement right away. And I, I was very honored to be able to be invited I was honored and also terrified <laughs> to be invited to the American Psychiatric Association. And I talked about these issues and I presented them with a lot of very concrete um, things that they need to look at, the changes that can be made in mental health treatment settings. And one of the things that, that came up in the survey, and, and it comes up so often in, in my work, because I'm a therapist now, and my work at Portland Hearing Voices and doing peer support, is that so much of our issue is not mental health. So much of our issue is poverty. It's poverty. People are suffering from poverty. Poverty can drive you crazy. The stress from poverty can drive you crazy. Poverty is the issue. Money is a really, really important taboo subject in our, our country. We are medicalizing poverty and calling it mental illness rather than facing issues of poverty and empowerment head on. There was an incredible study that was done by my friend Alicia Ali at NYU where she took people who fit the criteria for clinical depression and she didn't give them medications, she didn't put them in mental health treatment, they didn't go to hospitals, none of that. You know what she did? She gave them enterprise loans to start small businesses, collectively and collaboratively. And then after these people diagnosed with clinical depression had started their businesses and were making money, guess what happened? They were no longer depressed. Wow, okay, you can't quite put that in a pill, so it's a little bit problematic to market that. That's why we don't hear about those kinds of solutions, but we need to directly address poverty issues. Our, our movement in a lot of ways is an anti-poverty movement. I want us to see our movement as an anti-poverty movement and an ally with anti-poverty organizations like Jobs with Justice, for example, is a great organization to ally with. The Occupy movement is an incredible movement for us to be part of. And I have to say, I mean, we need to really rethink the way in which our disability system discourages people from getting off disability. I mean, I came off medications. Yeah, I came off medications, and that was hard, but me coming off disability was way harder than coming off medications. Yeah. Has, any, has anybody else tried to get off disability? You can't just call them up and say, stop sending me the checks, I'm off disability. You know, they keep sending you the checks, you have to set up a bank account, it's like really complicated thing, then they say, well, you know, you say you're no longer disabled, but we're going to evaluate you because maybe you were no longer disabled five years ago, and then now you're going to have to owe us all that money, and you just get scared and just want to hide and not deal with them. So the VA system is a little bit better, I think, with disability benefits than SSI and SSDI, but we really need to, um, to address this issue of poverty. And, and the belief that we can't work because we have emotional distress uh, this is something we need to really rethink, that actually emotionally distressed, a, a lot of people go to work when they're emotionally distressed. Emotional distress is very common in our society, and, and I spoke with some uh, clinicians in Austria. I was, in, I, was, I was in Europe recently. I have the honor to be able to, to travel and, and, and to teach, and so I was in Austria, and they do this really interesting thing at a clinic there 
which is every morning the, uh, the staff, the clinicians, and the people with diagnoses all get together and they, they rate their emotional experience, their, their mood, on a scale of one to 10. And all of them do this, the staff and the clients. And the, all the clients learn that sometimes the staff are having a harder time than the clients are. <laughs> Big surprise, right? They don't have a psychiatric diagnosis, but maybe they feel like life isn't worth living. Maybe they feel terribly depressed. And so people get this message that you actually, I can work, I can be part of society, and still be having emotional struggles. It doesn't mean that I'm a, a person who's just a broken person who can't be part of society, because these staff people are, are, are doing it. And then they get into conversations about what it means to have distress and how all of us help our wellness. And a lot of times, the clients have a lot of tools and know a lot about wellness that the staff don't know about. I mean, peer support is something that mental health staff need too, everybody. So, so the poverty issue is really, really important. I mean, we have a terrible, terrible set of policies around maternity leave and childcare. This would really, really help our society around mental health if we would improve maternity leave and childcare. A lot of times people go into extreme distress. They can't work, they can't, having a really hard take, take time taking care of themselves. They can't live on their own and they have nowhere to go because that's the way the society is set up. There, it, things are, people are living on the edge. There's no extra rooms. There's not extended families. There's not people who are at home not working. So people don't have anywhere to go, and then they end up in the, in the system. That's a poverty issue. That's about our society not being supportive of people who are having difficult times economically. So I think that we really need to go back to our roots. Our roots are in the civil rights movement. Our roots are in the lesbian and gay movement. Our roots are in the anti-war movement. Our roots are in the women's movement. Our roots are in the movement against poverty. Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about his values were being against war, against racism, and against poverty. And those are our values too. So we need to be, absolutely. So I, you know, I, everyone should vote. I can't tell you who to vote for, but please vote for Obama. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's a, a no-brainer. But if you don't vote for Obama, that's, that's okay, too. You're welcome. You're part of the movement. But, but, um, <laughs> but I, was, I, was really, I was really inspired uh, yesterday to hear the talk about our roots and liberation movements. I really see this as a human liberation struggle. The disability rights movement has made society better for everyone with disability access. Everyone has benefited. Just to give you a very tiny, tiny example, when all those curb cuts, ramps, this helps everybody. People with strollers, people with shopping carts, everyone's benefited by the disability rights movement taking the lead and changing our society. It's true of our movement too. We can, we're going to help everybody with our values. It's a human liberation movement. It's a human liberation movement. And and we're the best kind of human liberation movement. We're a diverse movement. We don't always agree on everything. We're unruly. We're chaotic. But that's OK. That's part of what is being a movement is all about. Um, we do live in a new social context. Um, I love that um, Joe Rogers said yesterday we need more protests because we do need more protests. We need to root ourselves in protests. We need an inside-outside strategy. People have heard this idea of an inside-outside strategy. This is something that people talk about all the way back to the 60s, all the way back to the labor movement in the 30s about how you work with institutions of power, how you work with people in the streets. And it's very, very important. Um, I, I, I believe that I embody this. I'm a survivor. I've been diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia. And also, I'm a therapist now. I work as a professional. Um, I did go and talk to the APA. But at the end of my talk, I took a cab across town and went to the protest and protested the APA. Um, so. And uh, you know your your opponent. You know your anytime you're in a political struggle, your opponent. And Sun Tzu talks about this in the Art of War, um, the book The Art of War. Anytime your opponent has no way to escape, that's when they're the most dangerous. So when I told the psychiatrists at the APA that I was going to the protest, I invited them to join us at the protest. I didn't say we're protesting you. I said we're protesting the APA. Please come and join us. A couple of them actually did. A couple of them came to the protest and joined us. So, um, and I really like the idea of sitting at the table. Yes, to sitting at the table, but we also need to be writing the agenda at the table. And 
And I think that when we sit at the table, we also need to, to talk about recycling the table and building a nice swimming pool instead. I think that's what we need to do. Um, so every movement struggles with the same issues that we struggle with. Every movement challenges the science. Who's more intelligent? Who's, who's um, got genetic problems? Every movement struggles with the language. Every movement struggles with stereotypes. So these are really important lessons that I think we have to learn. And we're in a new social context, though. Um, I'm reminded of the fact, I mean, things are different. It's 2012, 2012, right, 2012. And um, I'm reminded that, you know, when, last time that Alternatives was in Portland was in 2006, and a man named Jim Chassie had just been killed by the police. Do people remember that? Went to a big, this has been a huge, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Jim Chassie's death has been, has been a wound on the soul of the city of Portland for many, many years. It's, it's just tormented us. Um, alternatives joined a vigil of 500 people. Jim Chassie was, was killed by the police. He was doing nothing wrong. The police went after him. He ran. Please come after me. I might run too. I mean, the police are scary, okay? He's diagnosed with schizophrenia. The police jumped on him. They beat him. They didn't give him proper hospital treatment, and he died. The, the, the response from the police to Jim, Cass, Jim Chassie being killed was, was, was shameful. The, the response from the city was shameful. They wouldn't remove the, the doffers, officers from duty. There was evidence of a cover-up. The city finally had to pay $1.6 million in a lawsuit to the family. I mean, come on, that money could be spent much better than defending uh, police killing of people with mental illness. So um, it's one of the reasons that I joined the board of the Mental Health Association of Portland. The Mental Health Association of Portland has been doing really great work, advocacy work, often um, alone when everyone was sort of saying, well, it was this tragedy and we did the best so that we could. And of course, it's, yes, it's a tragedy for the police too. It's a terrible tragedy for the police, but we know that the police can do better and we know that the city can do better. And, and Mental Health Association was pushing and pushing and pushing. And finally, the federal government stepped in and made a conclusion that yes, there is a pattern of excessive force against people with mental illness in Portland. That was a recognition and a vindication for years of us saying this in the streets as advocates. So this is very, very disturbing. and something that's happening around the world and around the United States that, that, that we're, being, we're being killed. We're being terrorized. We're being beaten by the police. And I, I believe the police don't want to be in the position of interacting with mental health. They're being put in the position of being counselors because there's no community services. The police don't want to be in that position. They don't want to be playing the job of counselor or therapist or responding to people with mental health problems. Society has put them in that role unfairly. And as a result, many people are getting killed. Things escalate quickly. Um, the federal government does keep track of killings by police. And if you go to Wikipedia and look up uh, law enforcement killings in the United States, there are descriptions of what happened. It's very disturbing because so many people are in a different, some kind of altered state or extreme state, mental health distress. So many people are having suicidal feelings and we know that there are better ways to respond to those people. Um, this is something that's changing in, in Portland. Portland is trying to get police out of the business of responding to, to suicidal feelings. They shouldn't be coming. It shouldn't be 911, send the police when someone is suicidal, send a counselor, send a peer specialist instead. The city is trying to change this, but there's also a big move in our society to militarize these issues, to treat mental health as a public safety issue. It's not a public safety issue. In Portland, they want to give park rangers guns. I mean, come on, that's just, that's a completely the wrong direction that we're going. It's, it's fear, it's control, it's power, it's the misuse of power, and so, we need to really think about um, changing this relationship and we need to reform the police's relationship to mental illness, but the best way to reform the police's relationship to mental illness is to have no relationship to mental illness, to get them completely out of the whole mental health equation and get peer specialists and counselors and community services there uh, instead. And um, this is a big, big challenge. It's a new context for our movement. We need to speak more openly about it, and um, we're doing a lot of work tr training the police, which is great. We need to build those bridges. We need to really, really address this issue. It's so pressing. Thank you. There's, um, and there's one, there's one issue that I, I, I really, this is, the, this is the most important thing for our, for our future as a movement, and um, it's something that needs to be talked about more. And 
that's the, the title of my talk is, is, is Towards Our Future, our, Thinking About Our Future. And we need to recognize that, that one of the biggest mental health providers in the country right now is the prison system. The prison system. This, this is a very, very disturbing situation. Um, it's very disturbing. I'm just going to read you a few facts which should be shocking because they are shocking because the situation with the prison and the criminal justice system in this country is absolutely, absolutely disgraceful. Um, the United States now incarcerates more people than any society in human history. Any society in human history. Um, since 1972, the U.S. prison population increased from 300,000 to 2.3 million people. One in every 31 adults in the United States is in jail, prison, or on probation, or on parole. This is driven by the war on drugs. Approximately 80% of drug-related arrests are for possession. So the huge number of people in prison who are, or are locked up, the majority of people are locked up for nonviolent crimes. That's driven by the war on drugs. And since the 1990s, there was a huge increase in drug criminalization. And 80% of those arrests around, around drug criminalization were for marijuana. And how, how can we be prescribing people to take Xanax and Seroquel and Geodon and, I mean, I could go on and on, and then tell them they can't smoke marijuana? This doesn't make any sense. I think we need to decriminalize marijuana. I think this is a really important thing that we need to do. And that's, that's not to say you, that's not, I'm not saying you should smoke marijuana. I mean, come on. I mean, alcohol is, is not illegal in the United States, and I'm not recommending that people drink alcohol. It just means that it's driving our prison system, we need to really look at this and we really need to think about decriminalizing. And Oregon is a place where that's changing, it has changed in other parts of the country, but we have a law and order punishment mentality and this breeds fear and it breeds more criminals. It's not been shown that locking people up reduces violent crime. Um, there's a, a terrible use of informants where you make a deal with the police and you inform and then they let you off. There's mandatory in sentencing. There's excessive sentencing. People getting five, 10, 20 year sentences for nonviolent crimes or more. Uh, politicians prey on fear. Um, they use stereotypes, get tough on crime. It's a Hollywood television mentality. And we know that the issue of poverty and the prison system is completely connected because Come on, folks, money buys justice in this country. If you can afford a good lawyer, if you're privileged, you're going to get off where the person who doesn't have the money is not going to be able to get off. And this is, this is absolutely connected with, the, with poverty issues, and we need to address this. You know, my, my father was in prison. My grandfather was in prison. Um, I only spent a couple of days in jail. But, I, I mean, these are brutal, brutal places. They are terrible places to send people. They, I mean, if you've got mental health problems, of course they make them worse. And if you don't have mental health problems, they will cause mental health problems. <laughs> the best way to deal with mental health issues in prisons is to not lock people up in the first place. Let's not lock people up in the first place. Let's find alternatives. Let's find alternatives. Let's, let's deal with drug issues without with treatment and support rather than criminalization and locking people up. And jobs and absolutely community services and dealing with poverty. And we have to say that the, and we have to look at this very, very straight and we have to be very clear about this, that the prison system is a racist system. The prison system is a racist system. Um, whites and African Americans use drugs at the same rates African Americans are 10 times more likely to be locked up for drug crimes. African Americans make up more than half of all prison inmates, although they're more only 12% of the population. Blacks are incarcerated at a rate seven times as often as, as whites. And I am not exaggerating when I say that the situation with racism and the prison system is a continuation of Jim Crow and the slavery system in the United States today. There are more African Americans under cor correctional control today in prison, jail, or on probation or parole. There are more African Americans under control by the criminal justice system today than were slaves under slavery. 
It's shocking. It's disturbing. And there is incredible leadership happening in the African-American community to, to get us to wake up. The African-American community wants us to wake up around these issues. And, and as a white person, as someone who's educated, I'm more insulated. I'm more protected. I don't, I'm not as affected by these issues. But I want to wake up, and I want all of us to wake up around these issues. Because racism and the prison system is everybody's issue. It's everybody's issue. <clears throat> Prison is a brutal and traumatizing place, and one of the things that is the most disturbing about the United States today and about the prison system is the way in which prison rape has become so common. It's become an accepted part of our culture. More than 70,000 prisoners are raped every year. This is a trauma-creating, mental health problem-creating experience that people have in prison. It's, it's wrapped in shame. It's absolutely taboo to talk about. Prison rape is a very, very serious issue. And it is routinely held out as a threat. And think about it. It's accepted as our part of our culture. Think about how many times being raped in prison is, is joked about. Think about how many times it's talked about in, in TV shows and in movies. And it's an incredibly, incredibly disturbing fact that speaks to the to the deep deep I don't even I, I'm losing words because of this is so disturbing for me to think about I, mean, I, have, I have friends who've been raped in, in, in prison I've had friends who've been raped in hospitals and um, we, our movement needs to take on the issue of prisons in our society we need we need to work on this we need to work on this And, and where will the leadership come for a movement around prisons? The leadership will come from prisoners. The leadership will come from formerly incarcerated people. It, the same principles of the peer movement. And so we need, to build, we need to build alliances and build bridges. And people will say, well, we'll, we'll come on. You know, you know we, we can't mix these issues. It's not in our grant contract to talk about decriminalizing marijuana. It's not in our grant pro contract to talk about the new Jim Crow and racism and the prison system and dealing with the fact that so many prisoners are nonviolent offenders. And I say, to this, I say this to anyone who says that, this is exactly why we need to be a liberation movement. This is why we need to be a liberation movement. Because if we ignore, if we ignore this issue, then we're we are ignoring the, one of the most important issues facing our country today. I, I, think, I think it is the most important issue. I have to say, I think it's, it's the most important issue. And we have something very powerful to bring with a mental health perspective on this because people need to be healed from the shame and the trauma of being in prison. So, so I want to just say, just in, in, in closing, I, I should mention that, that Portland Hearing Voices is starting a support group for people who have been incarcerated. And I encourage um, people to, to develop support groups and peer support for people who have been incarcerated. And also to learn about the transformational and restorative justice movements. We don't have to lock people up. Even for violent uh, offenses, there are alternatives to brutalizing people in prison. There are ways that we can use community responses. And, and I think that if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were here today, if he hadn't been assassinated, we know that he would be taking leadership on this issue. Wouldn't he? Wouldn't he be working on this issue? Absolutely. So that is, that is the powerful spirit that our movement is all about, the inspiration that Dr. King gave so many of us and continues to be for so many of us. So let's continue in that spirit. I want to really thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And um, I'm really happy to be here. And I want to um, open up. We have a few more minutes. I want to open up. Um, the floor to questions or comments, and I especially want to invite anyone who has been affected by incarceration, anybody who is a former prisoner or who has been in the criminal justice system who might have something that they want to say about this issue, who has something they want to speak. And we have some microphones that are going around. Um, I know this, this issue has affected a lot of us. so. Hi, I'm Janice Sorensen, and um, well, something right in line with this, and had I seen your request mm. for what should I address for my keynote, I would have um, 
mentioned the Occupy JRC, the Judge Rotenberg Center in mm -hmm. Canton, Massachusetts, where it's, it's as close to incarceration as you can get um, students at the school, children at the school are given a fanny pack with, mm -hmm. um, with a shock device in them. And for a misbehavior, and please see the quotation marks for that, they are administered a shock by any one of the staff members. These mm -hmm. are not, not that it would be okay for therapists or psychiatrists to administer a shock, but these are just anyone who's working there has, a div has a, um, the ability to administer a shock. Um, Andre McCollins was shocked 31 times in one day. His initial shock was for not removing his jacket. Hmm. You can go to Occupy JRC online, just Google Occupy JRC, and hmm. it's hard to watch the video of Andre McCollins because there were remote cameras in the room where he was shocked. He was strapped down on a board hmm. and shocked 31 times, and s many of the shocks were for tensing up after receiving a shock. Mm. It is horrifying footage and it is something, this is where um, we need to demonstrate. I heard, uh, I think our first night, someone saying, you know, our movement needs to demonstrate more. We need to get back to that. Here's the mm. opportunity. Here are people who are utterly and completely disempowered and who need our support, who have no voice at this moment, and it's just horrific. So please go to and support the Occupy JRC movement, the Judge Rotenberg Center. And as you can guess, because it is the Judge Rotenberg Center, there is a lot of pushback, and it's, it's a pretty tough wall to um, traverse. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Who is, someone wanted to s speak? We don't have a lot of mics, so. Uh, let's go, let's go. Oh. I yield to the lady over let's here. Let's go, let's and then alternate, next. yeah. Okay, go ahead. We'll go on different sides of the room, so. Sorry, I lost track of who was first and everything, so. Thank you, Will. Yeah, thank you. My name is Angela Agnew, and I'm, I am a survivor of the mental health system, the military system, the criminal justice system, mm. and the trauma that we experience while we are incarcerated, the trauma of witnessing other people being traumatized is, is, is terrible even coming out of the criminal justice system and having to deal with the overlap of mental health, substance abuse, criminal justice, and, and trying to fit in, you know, being ostracized in, in one area, fitting in in another, and just not having that overlap. Um, housing issues. Some people can't even find housing because of their criminal history. Mm, you know, mm. and of course, getting employment is doubly, you know, mm -hmm. is, is really hard. Mm. You know, just checking that box, you know, do you have a felony or yeah. have you been in jail? You know, a lot of times employers won't even take the time to find out because yeah. they don't even understand the law surrounding checking that box. Mm -hmm. You know, and don't want to take the time to find out how to, how to work around it because mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. are ways, you know, just because you have a criminal history, doesn't mean they can't employ you. Mm. Um, thank you. I want to thank you mm. for, for your work. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I, I, would, I would like to see an amnesty because so many of those felonies are drug. I would like to see an amnesty of anyone who's ever gotten a felony for a drug con conviction. I would just like to see an amnesty for all that because those people need to re-enter society. I mean, this is, this is terrible. So let's go on this side of the room, and then we'll go, so. Hi, I- And thank I, you, thank you so much for that. 
Hi, I grew up in the mental health system. I went to specialized schools, contained classrooms, and I also was in the juvenile justice system. But the mental health system is seclusion. I, I was not allowed to make friends in uh, my whole childhood because they were schools I went to were also treatment centers. Mm. I was not allowed to engage mm. with anyone because of the liabilities. And it's all trauma, you know, being separated from your family and friends, not being able to uh, develop, not having a chance to fail. We as humans grow through mm. failure. Yeah. And the system does not allow that chance to fail. Right on. No matter how old you are, but it, it permanently stunts us and it doesn't allow us to become the independent adults that we need to. So, you know, I, there's a lot that we can do, but it, mm. it's not just one system, it's all the systems doing the same thing to all of us. Thank you. Um, thank you so thank you so much. We only have a couple of minutes and I, I want to try and maybe take one or two questions. I also want to say someone handed me a note that has a, a poem that I think is very act, apt. Um, it's a poem and it says, what else should I say? Everyone's astray. <laughs> so let's go, let's go on this side of the room. Uh, just real quickly, my name is Shirley Prosey. I'm from Oakland, California. And I just want to say congratulations for embracing the whole issue of, uh, of uh, having the movement to speak on uh, the severity of the effects of the criminal system. Uh, I self-medicated, uh, being dual diagnosed, ended up having to take a deal, as they called it in Oakland, which uh, th um, 13 years later is still following me uh, because I've had to pay back every dime that they Like a plea bargain, you did like a plea bargain like deal. A plea bargain. Yeah, it's so and common. I had to pay back a fine, you know. Wow. But it was, the self-medication came from me being uh, um, bipolar and I was afraid of the medication, so I just used marijuana and mm. crack. But I came out of that, but what I'm concerned about now, being almost 70 years old, is to see my community being four generations now systematically killed and being used for fodder for people to be, um, to be uh, you know, receiving money, mm -hmm. you know. The people are, are, it's like four generations now, down to 20 years old, they're going in and out of the prison system like a, a revolving door. Mm -hmm. And they're coming out in Oakland as killers. And they're mm. killing each other. Mm. And that, need, and of course they're coming out and their mental health is totally messed up. Mm. Mm. And there's a reason for it, mm -hmm. because in prison they're being co-opted. Mm. And I'm very happy that you're stepping out of your comfort zone to address this because people don't want to, uh, they don't want to talk about it. Mm. And in mm. Oakland, it's ruined four generations in our community. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Folks, I'm very, I'm very sorry. We're out of time. It's going to take one more question. It's going to be a very short question. Please, or okay. comment. Yeah. Mine's a question. <laughs> okay, I'll be, I'll be short too. Preceded by, a, a preceded by a comment. My okay. husband was the first psychologist in Wyoming prison system. He went on to become the warden in Montana, lost oh. his job there because he was too kind to the prisoners oh. uh, in an era that was becoming increasingly harsh. But my question is this, and it's one I've pondered a long time. Um, Mick became a therapist. We moved to Arizona. We worked with people on a new system of care for kids. He was, um, had a license challenge for befriending clients. We were huh. told that you cannot be friends, that you are blurring the line when you are friends yeah. with a client. So yeah. my question is, how do we begin to address this? Because it's not psychiatry. It's the counselors yeah. that are the, the most ill-trained and frequently the ones who have the most impact on families. What do we do? Yeah. I, I, that's, I mean, that's a really great point. We need to start treating people like people rather than using confidentiality rules and the protections in a very excessive way that just ends up undermining connections and relationships and peer support. And I mean, I, I think that there, hopefully there are ways that we can overcome that kind of thing because it's so restrictive. It becomes controlling and limiting people. But, and you, you said it very, very well. I hope that you can speak out more about that issue and help educate around that because it's very important. So 
Folks, I would, I mean, this is so important. I would love to be able to talk more and hear more what people have to say, but we have to wrap it up. So thank you so much for the opportunity for this morning. Thank you. Thank you.